it's got KT 88s in it. I did that. That was my. It was your contribution. That was my contribution. I'm uh, thinking more is more. <laughs> to quote. Uh... Okay. Um, so here we have. Ah! 1978, May 18th, 1978, and um, now this had to be just pre-Korg putting 6550s in them because uh, B one two three, B four five six, B one two five, V one two three or twelve X sevens, and V four five six and seven. So this is a sticker that goes on either a fifty or a hundred watt amp that says five and six or uh, four and five or four, five, six, and seven are EL34s or 6550 USA. So they're saying that the amp is shipped with EL34s everywhere except in the US, they go with 6550s. So this is right at the period where they started doing that. And Korg started doing that because of the number of uh, warranty claims that they were getting for defective EL34s here. Mm. And uh, they've made that change to to uh, uh, mitigate warranty claims, um, and there would be a resistor change here in the um, in the bias circuit, depending on whether it had EL thirty fours or 6550s in it and I thought I thought the ones this but the, I thought there was a board that had the two values of the resistor written on the board but this just has 47k so I'm not exactly sure uh, did you change the resistor when you put the tubes no. in okay so we don't know if it's biased for 6550s or EL34s. My guess is that it's biased for 6550s because that's not the stock resistor that you normally see. It's usually like a, an epoxy coated resistor like this. So that has been changed. I think the original one might have been at uh, 27K. I'd have to go look it up because this is right off the top of my head. So we'll check into that. Um, but this is super clean. Now the first thing that you see is super super pristine filter capacitors there is no these practically look like they're brand new they do i looked at the day code i could be wrong but i want to say that it was 90 late 90s the date code is the 39th week of 1998 But this is a this is a seventy eight amp. Yeah. I... Um, and the soldering is super super clean. That led me to think that it was factory. But it could potentially have been changed because if you look at the wires in there, they're just stuck into the ends of the capacitors and not wrapped around. And normally. If you look on the pots, you'll see that the wire goes into the lug and wraps around a little bit, but they don't wrap around on here. This one does, but it doesn't, at the end of this wire, it doesn't wrap all the way around the lug. Right. But, so these were, these look like they were replaced a long time ago. And this one also has the 98, and these are LCRs. Uh, and normally you would just order those from Korg. So these were replaced 
a long time ago and they're pristine and I don't think they need to be replaced again. So what we're going to do is we're going to test them before we, um, when was the last time you powered this thing up? Bruce. I can't remember. Well, was it recently? Was it this no, year? No, it was years. Uh, How many well, years? Has it been 10? No, I'm going to say one year. I'm just gonna, I'm just, it's about one year since it's had power, and then I think it blew a fuse. Okay. And then went away. Okay. So, if you powered it up within a year or two, they don't need to be reformed. And that answers your question, do I need to bring up the voltage slowly? I don't know if you were asking me, do I need to bring them up slowly after I replace them? That's, yes. Uh... Okay, so the normal question you would ask in an amp that's been in the storage for a long time, do I need to bring up the voltage slowly because it hasn't been turned on a long time? And then somebody would say, well, why don't I just recap it? And then should I bring them up slowly after I recap it? And my answer is always, how do they look? Do they look good? Do they test good? Oh, well, I don't have a test. I was just gonna, I was just gonna replace them because that's what everybody says to do. And my answer is always, we test them first and see if they need to be replaced. Because you certainly just don't arbitrarily replace capacitors that are reading good. And the first thing you do is just put them on a capacitor tester. So here's the main filter cap over here where each one of these is a 50 mic. And let me verify that. 50, usually 50 mic at what, 500 volts? Yeah, a dual 50 at 5. Dual 50 at 5. This one, the two 50s are wired in parallel, and then this one, the, 50, the sections are used individually, and this one is uh, a dual 50 also, and its two sections are used individually. So this one, since they're paralleled, will test them as two parallel capacitors, and they should read 100 mics because there's 250 mics in parallel. And as you can see, 107, 106. The capacitors, when you put them on a test meter, they sort of accumulate a little bit of a charge from the meter. And that's why you see the, volt, the, the number drift around a little bit. But 106. So that's um, a capacitor that normally has a tolerance and it should say the tolerance on them, but it may not. No, it doesn't. They're, this capacitor, this kind of capacitor is generally plus or minus 10 or plus five minus 20, that kind of tolerance. So if you're talking about 105, that means it's uh, plus 5%, mm -hmm. which they generally go 10, 20 in either direction, which is perfectly fine. Big capacitors like this, they're just really storage devices. So how much voltage difference in storage there is between 45 mics and 55 mics is, is insignificant, it doesn't matter. And that's why the tolerance is usually so wide on these. The good thing about these older capacitors that people just never even think about is the, um, the foil that's used as the storage medium inside the capacitors is generally thicker than the capacitors that are made these days. Capacitors that are made these days are more refined and more designed for a specific application, and there's a lot more to choose from, but the, uh, the metallic substrate inside the capacitor, the foil, is generally thinner and generally doesn't last as long, but they're more accurate and they could be, you know, have tighter tolerances and run at higher temperatures. But as far as longevity is concerned, um, the reason that I don't like replacing old capacitors unless unless they're really bad is they do just tend to last a lot longer. They're stout. They're stout. All right, so we beat that dead horse. Uh, and now we go to the one that is two 50 mic sections. And this is section one. And again, it's absorbing a charge from the meter. Um, that caused it to read 100 mics for just a second, and then it drops down uh, when it's through charging off the meter, and you can see 53. So um, 
if it was reading 55, that would be 10% high. But we're reading like 50, 53, so we're 7% high. Again, well within the tolerance range. And the other section is charging a little bit. And then it'll go down. And it'll probably uh, settle out. It might settle out a little lower or... Uh, it might because there are because there's a resistor between this section and this section this section might pick up a little res residual voltage from the other one as since I'm testing them in circuit and normally I wouldn't disconnect them from in circuit because they uh, an original amplifier will have the 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 the, lead, the lugs on the capacitor will have that red paint on them right and I don't like to lose the red paint if it's original and they're in good condition. So I try to test them in circuit so that I don't disturb that red paint, but it's already gone. So I'm disconnecting them so I can check this capacitor section out of circuit and see what it does. And there, and there you are, 5% high, right where it should be. And now I'll go back and check this one. And again, right where it should be, it's 1% high one or two percent high. So the effect of testing them in circuit one because they're coupled together with a uh, with a resistor right around here somewhere. One of the the characteristics of one is bleeding into the other side through the associated circuitry and so it was affecting the reading of the two sections. All normal stuff. These capacitors so far just reading from the standpoint of capacitance are good. They're not shorted. They're not acting weird. They're not acting weird with their interacting too much with the meter where they would give you a false negative or a false positive. And because I pulled that wire out of the lug, I'm gonna desolder the lug so I can properly flow the solder back on them. I put the lead back well, You in. want to do a good job or something? Uh, How weird. I like to... I like to try to be fastidious when, when, a, when a unit is as clean as this inside. When the camera's on. When the camera's on. Well, when, when the client's When the amplifier right is as clean you. as it is like this inside, <laughs> I like to leave as few footprints as possible inside. What if it's crappy inside? Do you try and leave as many footprints? It as depends possible? on <laughs> it depends on what the customer wants. If they just look, just make it work. Uh, it already looks like ass inside. <laughs> just just make it work. Uh, I'll do I'll do my part of the job as clean as possible. If you want, but you're not going to go through there and nip and tuck everything that I'm has ever not. Happened be, in the you know, there's the people empire. that do that. That's not my gig. Yeah. That's there's another kind of tech out there. That's their gig. Um, but my mission here is to make sure good parts don't get thrown away over cannon, mm -hmm. over over wise tales. over um, unspecified belief systems that, that result in good parts going by the wayside and being replaced by new parts that probably and are usually demonstrably not as good as what the originals were. <clears throat> because those are that good mm -hmm. as far as the readings and all three were replaced at the same time, they have the same date code, and this is where all the current draw happens. These are the ones that are really under load. These are the, these are just decoupling caps, and they're under the board. You know what? There's an easy way to. I was just saying I'm not going to test it because I thought that's where you're going. But I was going to say leave. I'm not going to test it because it's kind of hard to get under the board. But you know what? There's an easy way to get under the board, and that's not to get under the board. It's to loosen the bracket and just pull the thing out by its leads and they're hopefully long enough that it'll allow me to slide it out a little bit. And to do that we have to oh, a good old fashioned Marshall flat blade flat, screws. Straight edge screwdriver. 
Uh, Perfect for slipping up and scratching well, the hell out of everything. They're on there really, really tight. Oh, even better. And uh, see, I don't want to mess with that. And they're if brass. This was gonna... And they break. Oh, there we go. Yes, this has definitely been replaced. Okay. There's the ground lug. And we've got. They're talking to each other through the coupling resistor, but, and knowing that, I'm accepting that 62 mic as it'll be 50 if it was disconnected. Mm -hmm. Same here, see this one is drawing down. This one's good also. And we will, of course, verify that once we fire it up. So what, whatever was blowing the fuse on this, is most likely going to be either a shorted power tube or the fact that you didn't change the bias it was just idle idling and it was it ran away and what that means is if the tube is biased too hot it'll start to heat its own internal um elements the grid sure and all of that when they get to a certain temperature the bias will start creeping up and it'll get to the point where when you stop applying power or signal to it, it won't go down. It'll just keep increasing and it'll run away. It's like the you'll greenhouse start, effect. You'll start to see, yeah, you'll start to see the plates glowing red and then you'll pop the fuse. So let's have a look at what the fuses are in there to make sure we're on the right. This weather takes all the, the friction off of my fingertips. So I can't hold anything. My fingers are really slippy, slippery. So this is a 3 amp fuse. And a 3 amp fuse is standard for this, but it's normally going to be a slow blow fuse because a fast acting fuse will generally blow too quickly in there but in a lot of cases Marshall put fast acting fuses in the in the AC position now the DC fuse was the DC fuse the blue? I don't know it just stopped working it just stopped working Yep, the DC fuse. Now, what is it? It is a half amp, which is what it's supposed to be. So, without the power tube in it. So, the DC fuse is the one that normally goes when the power tube's short. Okay. Or, or draw too much current. So, I'm placing that before. Fire it up. And I'm going to fire it up without the tubes in first. But before I do that, I'm going to check to make sure that the power supply diodes are good. They probably are. Let's just make sure. That's a go. That's a go. That's a go. That's a go. And the bias diode is the reverse polarity. Come on. That's a go. All right. That's all good. It's like you're dialing up your uh, time travel equipment. I am. How many of this God, style Godzilla. amplifier have you been inside in your, all your years of servicing these things? 11 after? billion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
if you're in this business and you haven't seen a thousand of these, then you're not really in this business. Uh, you you can always you can always tell the sort of evolution that Marshall is going through by looking inside their chassis, and the evolution that's going on is the same thing that I experienced when I started doing this, which is as you go along, uh, component types that become available they change to suit the biggest manufacturers that use those kind of components, aerospace, military, large commercial, uh, home entertainment, all that kind of stuff. That's really what drives the kind of components that, that they make the most of. So those are the components that are the, that are the most competitively priced, not necessarily because they're made cheaper, but they're just evolved versions of the way they used to make them. And you can see here that they're using these box film capacitors. It's probably very similar in quality and behavior to the film capacitors that they used before that. They're just the current stuff that you would be able to buy and you would, they would evolve their circuit board designs to accommodate those. And you can see that there's a transition going on by looking at the board outline. You see here, there's a big footprint for a big capacitor, and that same footprint is also got an additional hole in is it for a small... Is that wire taped down? Small capacitor. Yes, this is a wire taped down. And what it is, is it's a, um, it's a signal wire coming off of the preamp wiper. So it's taking uh, the the signal from the first input stage and linking it into the second put input stage, which is what makes it a JCM 800 for, to give you that extra gain stage. And it's, this is the wire going back into the, to the grid of the next preamp tube here. Okay. This resistor here is, um, the input grid a resistor of this jack. It's called a, um, a grid stopper. It's the resistor between the jack and the first gain stage. And in order to control oscillation, I knew you were going to say that. Which they, which needed to be done because they weren't using shielded wire to get from here over to the grid of this this tube. When the gain in that particular part of the circuit goes up, it tends to become unstable, starts mm -hmm. oscillating. What they do is they wrap the uh, they wrap the plate lead off of that gain stage around the grid stopper that goes to its same input stage, which is 180 degrees out of phase, and that cancels some of the gain a little bit and stops the oscillation. So if you take that little glued piece of wire off of there, you'll start getting that high-pitched squeal. Yeah. And the only way to get rid of it is either glue it back down or replace it with shielded wire. If you use shielded wire, then you have a little bit of capacitance in shielded wire, and you might say, well, it's not as bright as it was. Well, it's canceling out of phase at high frequency by using this method, so it'll also sort of taper off some of the top end, too. So... Why would they do it this way instead of doing a shielded wire? Because then they don't have to buy shielded wire. Another thing to inventory, another cost. It's more expensive than just a plain piece of wire. And how much is a little blob of glue? Nothing. Right? So that takes care of that. Now, we're ready to turn the power on. And when we turn the power on, the only thing that's going to energize is the... Is the, the only things that are going to energize are the filaments and the bias supply, because the standby only controls the plate voltage supply and the AC voltage going to the rectifier bridge. So the large filter capacitors are not gonna energize until the standby switch is turned on. So when we turn the power on, we're not gonna see the DC fuse blows because there isn't any DC current flowing into the high voltage power supply yet until we turn the standby switch on. So we'll see, uh, we'll see the bias supply come up. All right, so um, we have the first filter uh, stage of the um, 
uh, the bias circuit, which are, let's have a look. Before I shoot my mouth off, is there a date code on these little guys? Somebody that replaced the main filter caps in 1998 might have been conscientious enough to do the same on these, whether or not it was needed. I used to have so many of those suckers laying around. And these are Sprague 1406s, which I don't recall if they were original, but this doesn't look like they've been replaced. And you, well, they're USA capacitors, so they have been replaced because if they were original, they would be a European or British supplier. Makes sense. And the date code is a little indecipherable to me. It's USA 0421H. So that's gonna remember that, Bruce. That's gonna tell me the date code. It's gonna be t it's gonna be the date and the factory that they were made at, and all of that. But TVA 1406s were the, were a typical series of Sprague atom capacitors that you would find in the late 80s and early 90s. Oh, okay. So those have probably been replaced. So that possibly happened at the same time as the filter capacitors. Yeah. It's possible. So somebody, somebody was into the recap job mantra way ahead of the game here. Right. Which is, I think, fascinating. So um, we're going to turn the standby switch on now, and nothing is really going to happen because there's no power tubes in there, but we are going to check the main plate voltage, which is right here, and see what we get. And we get 388, 390. Do that again? Oh, I didn't I'm, capture that. You, you were giving it the smell test. Gonna use my nose. That's right. Gonna use my ears. I mean, and this is really what you do. You, you can measure and you can use experience, but your ears and your nose tell you a lot about what's going on in an amplifier when you fire it up. You can in immediately smell when something isn't right, and you can immediately hear when something's right. You'll hear a capacitor start to hiss if it's going to get hot and is under pressure and starting mm -hmm. to leak you'll hear uh, a power transformer groan if there's an additional load no on kidding. it huh. it'll make a sound you'll huh. be listening for that and uh, you might even actually feel it from the chassis and that's why i lean on the chassis and listen and smell when i turn something on at the same time, I watch because if I see anything like a little bubbly, bit of, bubbly. little bit of a bubble yeah. appearing here, I stop looking there because I have had capacitors blow open. Ooh! Right after I moved, you'll my shoot face. your eye out, yeah, kid. Yeah, I've been in a couple of situations like that. So we have 400 volts there, and this is 120 volt, 117 volt amp set up to 118. Uh, so for a, a late 70s model, a 400 volt plate supply would be normal. They were lowering the plate supply to try to get more lifetime out of the tubes. Uh. And then the amps are getting weenier sounding, so they replace them with 6550s to try to compensate for that weeniness. Isn't that interesting? And then it gets more brittle, mm -hmm. and you know, it's like this too. So this, Let's put a little more, uh, that's too much salt. All right, well, the salt's already in there, so maybe a little mm -hmm. uh, molasses to sweeten it up. Nah, mm -hmm. now it's Thick too much. Thicken that base. You just, no, now then it's... it becomes additive. You keep adding, you keep band-aiding things until you know what? We have to like go back to square one and come up with a new model and address all of those things in a holistic way rather than we've bandaged it as much as we can bandage it. No, Steve. What you do is you throw a graphic EQ yeah. at the end of the whole stew. Yeah. You put a boost in the front and put you an put EQ put in the loop. The uh, oh, it doesn't have a loop. Well, you got to put one. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at these. I don't see any dark spots on the plates. So I don't see any indication of... This is what would have caused the fuse to pop. 
Yeah, but uh, there, so the fuse would pop for two reasons. If the tubes run away, you might see a little discoloration on the plates if they were red plating and they got way too hot. Uh -huh. You might not see an indication of red plating if there was just a short in one of the tubes and it would just blow the fuse because the, sh the tube itself was short. So we're going to plug these in. The amp is still powered on, but the standby switch is off. So by just plugging the tubes in, while the power is on, the only thing that's going on is the filament supply. That's going to heat up the tubes to the point that they will be ready to either accept the plate voltage or <laughs> route the plate voltage directly to ground, yeah. which will blow the fuse. So let's have a look, shall we? And we already checked the bias voltage, but now that I've got the power tubes in there, I'm going to check it again right at the grids of the power tubes so I can see what we're getting there. And we're at minus 41 on the tube power tube grids. So I don't know what the current draw on these is yet until I power up the power supply. But I'm only going to power up the power supply really quickly so I can see if the tubes are good before they fail or before the fuse fails. So I'm going to want to look at that pretty much right away. right in at the phase inverter and bypass all the tone controls in the master volume. Or maybe I'll use the master volume. Yeah. I'm going to use the master volume as a signal controller off of my signal generator. That's what I would do. <laughs> I would probably plug it in a flux capacitor, but... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's a, there's a legitimate reason to do that, too. But I've got a lot of signal coming out of my signal generator, and I'm going to need it to drive the phase inverter to full output. So I go to the master volume so I don't blast the power tubes with signal before they get a chance to turn on. And I'm also going to monitor the plate voltage to see if it loads down when I turn the standby switch on, indicating that there's a shorter power tube. So let's see what we get. We got 375, so we lost 25 volts. That would be normal voltage drop for powering something up. And I need to change my trigger so that I can trigger off of the amp's output. Three seventy six, and we bring it up, and we need more voltage there. Just a little bit. Right there. There's clipping. No crossover distortion whatsoever. And that means the tubes are probably biased too hot. Right, so I'm going to take the signal off and I'm going to read first the DC resistance of the transformer primary. Let's see what the approximate voltage should be. Forty-two ohms there. Mm. 
43 ohms there. Okay, so we're going to calculate the idle current of the tubes by reading the voltage drop across the secondary, the primary, sorry. All right, so we got 42, we got 43 ohms. I'm just going to do, well, they're close enough so it won't really matter. I'm just going to do one side. I'll do this side, the 42 ohm side. And now I'm going to read with no signal 1.9 volts of drop. 1.9 divided by, what did I say, 42 ohms? 42. Is 45 milliamps. So this is idling at 45 milliamps. 45 milliamps times 378 volts. Wait, no, I'm going to do it again. 378. Damn it, I always hit the buttons wrong when I do this. I said 378, right? 378. 0.045 times 378. Thank you. 17 watts. So the power tubes are idling at 17. There's no crossover distortion, uh, which means that you could crank the bias a bit and introduce a little bit of crossover distortion, but it's not really necessary because there's, they're KT88s, they can handle like 20% more dissipation than an EL34. They also are not equivalent to EL34s in terms of their impedance. So there's an impedance mismatch going on that Marshall never addressed when they, or Korg never addressed more correctly when they decided to put 6550s. They were looking for reliability tube that wouldn't blow. They didn't care that there was an impedance mismatch. 6550 impedance is more like a 6L6. An EL34 is decidedly different. So the output transformers wanted to see the impedance of EL34 is driving whatever load reflecting back to the power tubes. And what we're seeing here is a mismatch. We're also seeing 17 watts of dissipation on a power tube that is rated at 42 watts dissipation. So that's more like 40% of total plate disp dissipation. Most people like to bias the output tubes at 70% plate dissipation, which in, if this was fitted with EL34s, that's what you would normally do. You would run them at about 35 milliamps and at that at that plate voltage, they would be running at around, you know, 20, 20 watts of dissipation, 19, 18, something like that, which 70% dissipation would be about that, about 18 or 20. But we're seeing 17 watts of dissipation on KT88s that can handle better than twice that. So why did the fuse blow? We still don't know because we know that we're conservatively biased now. We can know that the plate voltage is really low, relatively speaking. You normally see, like in our deliverance amp, for example, 430 to 450. In an earlier JMP, 450 would be really typical. Um, in like a JTM 50, 470, 480. In an orange, more, mm. you know, uh, in a high watt, you'd expect to see 430 to 450 in either one of those models. So this is really sort of set up not to fail. Why did it fail? Do one more check to find out. Well, the one thing I am going to tell you is no changing the cap. This is absolutely unnecessary. Now, before, before I go to the banging on the tube test, Let's go back and look at a fun thing called Ripple. Ripple in the power supply. Planes, trains. And alligator clips. Ripple in the power supply is part of the process of AC voltage being converted to DC voltage. When it's AC, it's a sine wave. When it's converted using diodes into DC, it's a series of humps that are all on the positive side of the zero line, as opposed to AC, which is there's a hump on the positive side and a hump on the negative side. The rectifier bridge changes all those humps to the top side, and then the filter capacitors charge up as those humps grow, 
and the voltage is depleted out of them at a slower rate so they don't look like a bunch of humps they look like a ripple and that's where the word ripple comes from so now and then when it's acdc it's just time to rock totally time to rock Kettle. so i'm looking at i'm looking at the uh the ripple on the main filter caps now uh i'm not going to adjust the frequency on my scope to show you what the that the ripple actually looks like ripple because i'm triggering it looks like something you'd see some graphic from an 80s well if i if i change the if i change the trigger to the input that i'm using you'll see that there is a there is a distinct At the, at the setting I have on the scope, you're basically seeing a big hump there. Mm -hmm. If I change the frequency on the scope, you would see that as ripple. I see. So that's on the main filter capac capacitor where all the current draw is, where right. all the, the storage is happening. Right. And then the next stage is partly storage, but mostly decoupling, and you see the ripple drop down to practically nothing at that point. Oh, yeah, it's almost parallel. Yeah, and then the next decouple stage after that, even less. Oh, look at that. And then when you get way downstream to the filter caps that often get changed for no reason, <laughs> you see what you're actually seeing there is not ripple anymore. You're seeing the noise generated by That's the That's what I would think, yeah. Load. yeah. So... Again, the capacitors are doing their job. We'll, what we'll do now is we'll run some signal into the thing. Again. And watch the ripple increase as we turn up the volume. time boys and girls here let me go up to four oh, that looks like the dna helix mm -hmm. so while we're watching the ripple on one channel we're bringing up the signal on the other and you can see the the sine wave on the speaker output and you can see the power supply ripple reacting to that power increase it'll settle down when the output power is not modulating the power supply so if that capacitor was bad this slightly disturbed blue line would really show a lot of ripple because it would be under stress and it would not be able to control that ripple any longer and here farther downstream you see the flat line again yeah so this is, why, this is why I always say with cap jobs, you can measure this shit and you can know definitively the condition of the capacitors before you arbitrarily replace them. And so why, why just, since you got the amp open, why not just replace them? Because they don't need to be replaced. And if, so you, can, question. if you can get 20 more years out of them, if you just want to throw money down the drain to do that just because it makes you feel better, do that by all means. Right. Okay, so here we've got the signal going into the front of the amp now. My test signal okay. is going into the front of the amp. I have the master volume all the way up, and I'm turning the preamp signal up until the power amp reaches clipping. Now, if the filter capacitors, one more way that you can tell that the fil filter capacitors are filtering is that ripple that I showed you before, mm -hmm. that ripple would be modulating the output sine wave when I run the amp this way. And you would see that ripple. You can almost see it. I've jammed the output to the point where you can start to see a little bit of ripple, that sort of uh, fluctuating line across it. I've done, this, is the, this is the phase of Virgo, totally jacked. Uh -huh. Again, this is also the amplifier with KT88s, so it's not operating in the way it was really designed to operate. Um, but because of that, we're, 
we're seeing kind of a, a more rounded sine wave than you would normally see on an amp like this, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing any ripple. And what that really means is there's more filter capacity than is really needed for this amp operating under these conditions. Interesting. With EL34s in it, which actually have more gain than KT88s, they would actually pull a little bit more current out of the supply and you would start to see a tiny bit of ripple, but we're not seeing any. So that means, again, that's like the third confirmation that there isn't anything indicating the need to replace these filter capacitors from 19, what did we say, 93? Yes. 98. 98, 98, even better. Okay. I'm looking for an intermittent short on the power tube that might have blown the DC fuse. Again, we're just trying to find out what blew that fuse. We're not finding it. Now, why am I banging on capacitors? I'm banging on the tubes to try to excite an intermittent short. Why am I banging on the capacitor? Same reason. I've already established that they're working properly and probably don't need any attention, but I have seen a Marshall amp with LCR capacitors that worked right when you set it like this, and when you turn it oh, upside yeah. down, it didn't. And it's because one of the capacitors, the internal capacitor element, had broken away from the lugs, and when you turned it right side up, it would make internal contact and work. Right. And when you turn it upside it down, would it would contact. break contact, and they wouldn't work. <laughs> so that's why I did that. How long did it take to solve that one? That had to be it, maddening. Uh, well, it took about a half an hour because, I mean, at that point, it's like telling you something. When you when you turn it upside down and, uh, and an element changes in your, uh, in your observation, what's the next thing you do? Upside down, it's okay. Right side up, it's not. Something's making, shake it. Yeah. Is there something that I can hear? And I shook it, and I could hear kadek kadek kadek. I'm like, okay, where is that kadek kadek coming from? Yeah. And the, the thing that surprised me about that coming from a filter capacitor was that I had never seen that before. So mm. that was a day that I learned something. What do we got for premium tubes in here? All JJs. All right. So everything is in JJs. Did you put all these JJs in? I here? probably did. All right. So, um. I think at this point, I mean, we could go a little farther and get crazier and put EL34s in it and show how it would perform differently since the output transformer is actually wound for EL34s, but I think we want to get on to the 100. So I'm going to do one thing with this before wrapping it up, and that is I'm going to plug it. You're going to play ACDC with it? Uh, yeah. I'm going to When I turn the master volume all the way up, I hear hum, which is not unusual for an AC filament heated amplifier with a little bit of gain in the preamp stage. It also could be a little bit of leakage in the JJ12AX7, which are sometimes known to make a hum because of heater cathode leakage. So I just want to make sure that this is. Now, oftentimes when you hear hum, the first thing you might suspect is, oh, bad filter caps, it's humming. But again, you can isolate down to exactly where that hum is coming from. And if it was bad filter caps, the hum would stay when I turn the master volume down because that's before the power supply. I'm, you ready for the test, Bruce? I don't know if I'm... I'm, tr I'm not really trying to to be overbearing in my my analysis that the filter caps don't need to be replaced, but yes, Well, absolutely. that's what I'm... That's what we're learning. I actually am going overboard, because why not? Well, it's, you're the scientist. It's weird. weird. I mean, I just hear this stuff on the street, and I assume... You gotta replace this. Yeah. And that is a big that, thing. We, uh, there's a lot of hearsay, and it's uh, so many guys will tell you, you just do it. Right. You don't even talk about it. Don't listen to Fred. He's just like a, he's just out of his mind. He just wants to be contrary and blah blah blah. No, it's you're not out of your mind. It's well, of course I'm out of my mind, but okay, just, I haven't lost touch with 
facts, evidence, and science. We still don't know why we blew the DC fuse. It could have just been an could. intermittent short in the power tube that resolved itself. And what that means is in the tube there are fine grid wires in the input grid that in a combo especially, more vibration, some of those little delicate grid wires can break loose and drop down and when they drop down um, between the plate and the cathode will cause a short blow of the fuse at the same time evaporate that little piece of grid wire and now the tube is good again oh so that could have happened especially in an app like this it's a combo you play it loud and the tubes in this particular amp are mounted this way horizontal uh. so much better opportunity for a fine piece of grid wire to lay across the plate in the, in the cathode and evaporate. So probably at the same time the fuse blew, that little piece of fine grid wire melted and, and just turn, turned into vapor. It um, could have just been Bruce's fault too. Like just your vibe. It could have just been a bad boy. Your vibe ruined the fuse, you know? Were yep. you in a bad mood that day? I like I said, this was like a year, maybe two ago. It stopped working. I just set it aside. And were you mad when you were no. playing it? No, no. <laughs> I, I probably powered it up. It was probably sitting for years and years and years. I powered it up and played it for a little bit, and then it stopped working. I'm like, oh, okay. No, no another project. Like, like most guitar players. Yeah, go another project. Put that away in the corner and forgot about it. I got eight more. Screw it. I'll just put that in the closet. Yeah. Well... Yeah, with this sucker waiting in the wings, <laughs> I mean, who cares? All right, let's move. We're gonna move on to that. Now we're gonna button this back up. We're done here. We're done here. Yeah.